everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today's webinar. My name is Lance Franson and I will be your host today. Uh, starting this webinar, I want to go over a couple of things. Um, all of your lines have been placed on mute to avoid any background noise. Uh, the presentation portion of this webinar will last around uh, 35 to 40 minutes and we will be followed by a Q&A session. If you have a question at any point during this webinar, please enter it into the Q&A box in the right-hand corner of your screen and we will respond at, it at the end of the session. Uh, we are recording the session and you will be notified by email when it is available for download. We will also be sending a survey and it would be much appreciated if you could take a few minutes to fill it out. We will use the feedback to continually improve our uh, events. This SDL Access webinar is part of a series on how to get the most out of your SDL language technology products. As you can see on the screen, we're hosting a series of SDL Access webinars um, where we hope to see you as well. Uh, next webinar will be on the 31st of July. Uh, about uh, SDL multi-term workflow, and the third one will be about uh, will be on the 9th of August. And today's webinar is called Translation Technology Insights, and your speakers are Massimo Gislandi, Executive Vice President of Translation Technology Solutions, and Neil Ferguson, Product Marketing Manager at SDL. So we're expecting this webinar to last around 35, uh, 35 to 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. And if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please pop them into the Q&A box and we're sure to answer them at the end of the webinar. And I will now pass it over to Neil to begin the presentation. So thank you, Leonard, for that introduction. As uh, said, my name's Neil Ferguson, Product Marketing Manager for TP Solutions at SDL. I'm delighted to be joined by our VP, Matthew Mogus Landy. Hello. Um, so just a little bit of context around the Translation Technology Insights. This was um, what you're gonna see in this presentation are the results of probably one of the largest, if not the largest um, research, technology research in the translation industry for some considerable time. Um, we have responses from nearly 3,000 people, so it's a considerable sample that we're talking about here. And that was across 115 countries, so a truly global research with many varied positions and job titles and various roles um, from the translation industry. And so I guess the real question is, why did we do this? Um, why did we take the pulse of the translation industry? And I think one of the key things that we see as a technology leader is that we're always having many, many discussions, whether it's at a roadshow, whether it's directly with a customer, whether it's conferences, whether it's through surveys. We see a lot of data. We hear a lot of opinions. Um, we hear a lot of advice. And we hear a lot of people talking about what the industry should be doing, what the future might be. So these are all very varied viewpoints. Some overlap, some don't. So there's a lot of debate about where the industry is going. So what we thought we would do is, okay, rather than have a lot of these ad hoc conversations, is trying to put a little bit of science behind it and try to put a bit of structure to it. So this research was conducted with that in mind to try and get a consensus of where people thought from every um, space in the industry, every sort of position, whether it's a, a corporation or enterprise or a language service provider or a freelancer, is where we think the industry is going. So in a nutshell, the result of that was that we saw five prevailing trends that you can now see on the screen. There were more than five, but these five were the, the key ones. And what we want to do now is take you through each of these. Um, today, it's impossible to go through all of that data. We do have some details at the end where you can get further information on each of what we call the pillars. But just looking at the screen now, we have five. One, first one is quality. Then we have productivity. Uh, probably no surprise to most of you on the webinar today. Um, they're probably the most talked about ones. Quality is always a very strong subject of conversation. Productivity, of course, everything is about getting things done quicker, probably not just in our own industry, but in all industries. Then we have new ways of working. We've looked at how, over the years, things have changed in the industry. System and workflow integration, and a rising trend that we see very much today is that one of user experience. So moving ahead, the first one we'd like to cover now is quality, and I'm gonna hand over to Massey now to talk a little bit about the quality side of things. Thank you, Neil. Um, I wouldn't say this was a, a complete surprise, but quality is king was probably one of those topics that did catch me a little bit. Um, 
somehow. It was a little unexpected. This was the trend that um, came up um, at the top um, of um, the things which are more, most important to the translation industry. And so much of what we hear um, anecdotally um, when we're out at conferences, events, and we speak to people, um, so much of the focus is on productivity, deadlines, costs. And somehow quality is one of those items that somehow gets missed. So it did come as a slight surprise to all of us um, that quality is six times more important than cost and two and a half times more important than speed. And so at first we thought, are these, is this the translator's voice? Um, and so we did look at the, the details um, within the data to see exactly what corporate department managers and translation agencies were saying. And even in that respect, quality is four times more important than cost. So this in somehow re put quality at the top of that triangle. Um, there's obviously um, a constant tension within the translation industry between delivering the right quality, do it in the right time frame, and all of this at the right cost level. Um, but in somehow we thought um, that cost um, were at the top of that pyramid, where in fact quality does remain at the top of the pyramid. Um, so this obviously has some implication, and, and it, it does make um, make us all think about the role that technology needs to play um, to enable um, these three vaguely conflicting areas um, to coexist, um, and how we can maintain quality when there is so much uh, pressure anyway on speed and cost. So this was one of the first um, insights. Um, the other aspect within the translation industry is that quality is pretty hard to achieve um, the first time. Um, there is a significant amount of rework. 64% um, of those polled have to do rework, which is significant. And again, it's no surprise. Translating is not an easy task. Um, a lot of the people that um, we surveyed are in very complex industry that might cover patent, legal, um, sophisticated and unusual machineries, etc. And so the amount of rework is, is significant. The LSPs, of course, being in the agency in the middle of all of it, are the ones who bear the brunt of the rework with corporate and LSP somewhat lower. But it remains a really big issue, the amount of rework that takes place in translation. So achieving quality um, is super important, but it's also pretty challenging. And so we were looking at what are the main reasons to do rework. Um, and perhaps somehow unsurprisingly so, um, terminology came top. Um, so 48% of the rework is due to terminology inconsistencies and issues. Um, when you think about the amount of people involved in the translation, um, unfortunately the fact that often there are different people across different projects um, and the fact that terminology can be quite complex in a lot of industries and verticals. Um, it is not completely as surprising. Um, one of the interesting things is actually terminology is one of the things that you can stay on top of and can be controlled. There are other issues like styling, translation, inconsistency, and one of the favorite, translation doesn't sound natural, which are somewhat harder to control and technology plays a, a smaller role somehow to, to, to keep um, on top of. Um, this quality and rework issues, but terminology is certainly an area, and that's why we have a specific webinar on, on, on terminology. Um, it is one of the areas that can be uh, solved by technology, but a uh, very interesting um, fact there. And one of the um, other interesting pieces um, that came out from the quality um, part of um, the insights is around feedback. 
a lot of people within the industry don't seem to communicate enough. Um, and we do hear this when we talk um, to a lot of people in the industry, so it's interesting the survey confirmed it. Um, constructive feedback in particular is rare. Um, for the majority of the users, um, there is no constructive um, feedback. Only 40% um, of the people get um, constructive feedback, but 61% um, don't. Um, often when we get feedback is vague um, and so that makes it really hard to maintain that level of quality and you'll see it um, when it, we dig uh, we, we were digging a little deeper on um, the quality assess quality assessment side of it um, there's a lot of subjectivity um, so coming from a manufacturing industry um, I've been working in engineering firms before working in the language industry, um, assessing quality of a product, um, a piece of hardware, um, a component was pretty straightforward. But when it comes to language, um, obviously it's, it's tougher, but not that many people in the industry are really trying to do this. 51% um, of the feedback received is qualitative and only 24% is more subjective, quantitative type of feedback. So more often than not, um, it's not very clear what the quality issues are. So in a way, to, um, to sort of finalize this part on, on, on quality, um, the awareness of standardized metrics is very low within the industry. Three people in five are not aware of standardized metrics or models. Um, and there are some metrics and standardized system in the industry, but um, very rarely used. Only um, a few companies actually implement those. So to conclude what we learn on the quality, um, um, so quality is significantly more important than any other factor when it comes to translation, although perhaps it's not the most talked about consistently in a lot of the industry forums. And, and so there has to be some focus in ensuring that quality um, is kept um, at the highest possible level. And three key tips and three key areas to focus on is terminology management, which is one of the causes of rework, the highest cause of um, rework. Um, trying to familiarize and learn about some of the existing standards that are available within the industry and try to implement and embrace um, a standardized, standard quantitative based system to measure quality. One thing, um, Matthew, to add to that, I think um, as a technology vendor, it's interesting that you know we can offer solutions to help enterprise and corporations deal with these issues like terminology and standards. But one thing when we validated this research only recently for mm -hmm. enterprises is that there, there needs to be more of a conversation mm -hmm. as well between people and, and not just using the right tools, but trying to understand you know, that standards are there to be shared and utilized. And, um, yeah, it, it needs a bigger conversation. Yeah. I think that's very, very clear. So thank you for that, Massey. Uh, moving on to the next pillar or trend or insight, whatever you want to call it, we're going to now look at productivity because, after all, um, productivity is a key factor in, you know, in any industry, but in particular in the translation industry. For a number of reasons, we're in an industry that's growing all the time. The, the volume of translation is growing. The amount of content um, is clearly growing all the time. So we have a lot of things as a, as a technology provider to think about for our users and productivity clearly came up as one of those trends. So 72% of people believe that they would use lose competitive advantage without translation productivity tools and I guess that's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy that you know as technology helps us we get um, faster and faster that everybody becomes faster and faster. So it's like a, a domino effect. But to stay competitive, tools are very important. And I guess the mainstay of a cat tool or technology uh, productivity tools for the last two decades, say, has been the translation memory. 
and you know translation memory has been the core and at the heart of um, Travel Studio and most cat tools for many years now and we've made some advancements recently in our translation memory technology um, to help people get more out of the data that they've already got. But what's also interesting that um, when we surveyed uh, in the research, we found out that translation memory is clearly key, but it's not actually enough because a lot of the content, well, actually 50% of the content um, when we asked people um, was available through translation memory, which is great because that helps not only with productivity, it also helps with the quality side of things and making sure things are consistent. But it's not so good on the side that there's 50% on average new content for organizations and enterprises to deal with every year. So clearly, even though translation memory is a bit in the heart of the tool, it needs help. It needs um, support and organizations need uh, additional technology to help them um, translate all this content that we're dealing with. So the question is um, machine translation. Now, we, machine translation is not a new thing. It's been around for some time. But I think recently we've seen um, a lot of trends around particular improvements in MC and people actually starting to consider it. And what we saw was that 60% of the respondents um, from enterprise particularly agree that machine translation is essential in coping with those increasing demands. So you can see they strongly agree and agree. But that 61% is a realization and uh, an admission maybe, but actually out of those, only 28% of those who said that are actually using machine translation. So there's a big discrepancy between knowing about it and actually using it. And what the bottom graph shows on this slide is that of those 28%, 34% um, MTs used to provide suggestions that are post-edited and MT 8% is used to provide suggestions that we do not post, that are not posted. So there's a lot of brand new text that MT is being used for, 58% um, is being used by the translators. So there are questions still to be asked about MT. So in this slide, how is MT working out? What we see is that even though that there is a growth in MT solutions, 16% only are occasionally or rarely or never post-editing and 78% are post-editing most of the time. That's quite um, an, uh, an incredible figure because what it tells us is that um, although MT is there to help support the volume of content that translation memory not, might not be able to cope with, what we want to do is reduce the amount of work that needed to be done in those MT solutions because like translation memory, if we're doing some fuzzy match um, changes or some small changes in there, we don't want to introduce another technology that is effectively designed for productivity but is taking up people's time in post-editing the results all of the time. So there is still some work to be done on the MT side of things. And I think part of the reason for that is that we see that there is still uh, some education to be done on the types of machine translation that people would like to use. So what we see in this chart here is that 27% are using a combination of both cloud and on-premise. We see that 20% are using on-premise only. A lot of that due to the fact that there's still a lot of fear and a lot of um, concern about using generic MT in the cloud. There are options out there now that you can get MT maybe for free uh, from uh, web-based tools. And often we found throughout our research is that a lot of companies may not even know that internal employees are using external cloud tools to get their translations done, which of course, if you're dealing with confidential data, um, really needs to start looking at. So 20% are using cloud-based, and then 33% don't actually know what tool they are using of those that are using. They just know that in their translation department or somewhere in the company or in the business, they're using uh, some kind of MT tool. So I guess the conclusion here on the productivity side is that TMs are um, translation memories are still the mainstay. MT is also going to start and should start helping that. And we don't believe it's one or the other, actually. I think our conclusion is that both translation memory and MT should work together till we get to a state where the translation process is actually made easy for the translator to get hold of any asset that reduces that productivity time. But clearly, from the research, we see that 
the increase in content requires productivity enhancements in the technology tools such as CAT tools and um, other systems. So moving on, uh, back over to Massey on this. So new ways of working. Um, I guess we've all seen lots of changes in how, um, how we work. Um, anybody who's been working for some time obviously has seen the rise of the internet over the last 20 years, which has significantly changed how we work. This is also a very global industry. We talked about content explosion. So a, a very first point is around the complexity that we now need to face as an industry. Compared to a few years ago, the type of business content that needs translation has increased significantly. Um, there's obviously marketing content and product content, but there's a lot of rich media, customer support, there's a trend towards self-service, um, and generally, huge amount of content that gets created within a business, which then needs to be translated, localized across hundreds of um, languages, actually, in some cases. So if not dozens, so lots of different channels. Um, so the delivery channels are significantly increased from where they were a few years back. So the whole content creation and publication cycle has become way more complex than it used to be leading to a lot of pressure when it comes to translating. Translating sits in the middle between when the content is created and when it then gets published. Um, and in fact, we see agile content creation and translation, so content partially created and then translated. Um, but it significantly uh, rise the, risen the pressure um, to do uh, content um, localization. And one of the big consequences of this that we've seen in our research is what happened to the translation project. Um, long gone the days of getting an instruction manual in one piece with 300 pages, and that was it. Um, we now see project frequency increasing. Um, over the last five years, 73% of the respondents found that uh, projects happen a lot more quickly and deadlines are shorter. Ultimately, this is what we call chunking, um, which basically means um, that within the translation industry, um, the content that needs to be localized comes much more frequently in smaller packages. And uh, sitting down next to a typical project manager now within a company, um, what you see is a lot of small files for translations that might need to be combined. Um, you might receive 10 files of 100 words each that need to be translated within six hours. Um, and so this puts a lot of pressure within the industry, and we see it across all parts of the organization. So what we call somehow agile translation. Um, and We've seen a significant increase also on um, remote working within this industry. Um, as the amount of volume has grown, the languages, um, and just business models, models, especially within the translation agencies, have, have evolved in the last few years. 79% of agencies and freelancer work um, happens with remote teams. So the work is increasingly distributed. So we got lots of different forces in play. Um, on, on one hand, a lot of complexity. Um, we have a lot of small files that need to be translated very rapidly and combined with a lot of remote teams. So collaboration becomes a more complex discipline. Um, but also becomes essential to make sure that all these factors can be taken care of. And I think what we've seen so far is that actually is the industry and the translation process using the right tools. In a lot of cases, um, only 50% pretty much um, uses um, these tools, um, collaboration tools regularly. Only 15% uses cloud collaboration tools. Um, so 50% does not use any collaboration tool. 
which ultimately drives a lot of additional pressure and complexity in the industry. This translates into a lot of emails, into a lot of manual chasing, um, a lot of added complexity in the whole um, process, given the circumstances in content um, creation and publishing. Thank you, Massey. So that's the first three. We're now on to the fourth insight, which is <clears throat> more around the system and workflow integration. Interestingly, when we did the research, we found that out of all the people we talked to, 79% are using two or more categories of translation productivity software. What I mean by that, it's not just CAT tools, it could be um, terminology tools, it could be another um, type of machine translation or some system that helps in the process. But what it means is that people are dealing with a lot of maybe legacy technology that's in their company, um, different technologies that are being introduced. And just if we take you back to the slide that Massey showed earlier regarding the complexity in the industry, um, we've got a lot of processes, we've got a lot of systems. Um, coming from a corporate background, I, I in particularly remember um, you could have content in your web system, you could have it in your CMS, you could have it in the tech docs department. So there's even internally a lot of different systems and information that we have to deal with. And I think what we see now is the trend that organizations uh, and corporations are beginning to see they need to be more strategic with that content, which means they also have to look at the processes internally of how they connect all that content and how they eventually translate it. So the question remains is, can we create a more seamless and integrated workflow within the organization? And what we see is that corporations and agencies clearly prefer integrated software over standalone software, and that we're seeing a lot more need and desire for access to application programming, programming interfaces, APIs, in CAT tools, and that they are two times more important than they, twice as important as they were five years ago, and probably likely, whether it's an API or a connected-based solution, that translation tools are much more connected internally to all the other systems. And I think that's a progression that we hear a lot talking to our customers. And we see it very clearly um, in the research, thinking about what requirements there will be were from five years ago. So if we look at this chart here, we can see that not so long ago, only a fifth of corporations and agencies felt it was key for CAT tools to have APIs. That was probably in terms of the maturity of the industry because a lot of companies go through a maturity curve. They, they get their first CAT tool, then they add more CAT tools, maybe a solution on top. So a lot of companies were probably still getting used to understanding working with CAT tools. But as these needs and pressures have grown, we see today that a number has more than doubled. Um, to almost half the respondents that they need better integration. And it's expected by 2021 that um, it's a clear signal that the present preference for the industry future direction is that as a technology provider, whether it's us or somebody else, has to think about not just the tool that's delivering itself, but how it fits internally, how they will service that, and how they will get the people and organization working more efficiently on the workflows. And I think a lot of people are beginning to look at an overall workflow solution for their organization just to make things that much easier for themselves. So I guess this leads us to the last large trend that we have seen, um, which is around user experience. Um, user experience means many things to many different people. Um, and so there are various aspects to it. Um, so we know translation technology is important, it drives productivity. Um, and one of the key questions was also, how are people feeling around these tools? Um, in general, um, translation software is getting easier. Um, and compared to five years ago, um, we have 65% of the users and respondents in the survey, they think um, things are easier these days than they used to be. I've been at SDL for 12 years, and I remember when I joined, certainly um, Trados 2006 was a pretty complex product to use in comparison to Studio, um, our kind of latest offering. Um, 
but there's also been a move uh, towards um, increased expectations. Um, so people have been using actually cut tools for a long time, um, actually around 30 years. Um, we're going to be celebrating next year the 35th anniversary of um, Trados uh, as a company. Um, and so um, these tools have been around um, for a long time. However, expectations remain pretty high. So on one hand, um, we have a lot of expectations in terms of innovation. Um, this was also a slight surprise for us because we thought, given the fact that cat tools have been around for a long time, we thought that actually um, people would have assumed that this was pretty much as good as it could get. But actually, 55% of the respondent felt that we are only at the beginning of innovation when it comes to translation industry. So that puts a lot of um, expectations on us as a company to deliver additional ways to improve um, the translation productivity and the innovation in our products. With only 16% of the users um, expecting um, that translation productivity um, technology has um, peaked. And on the other hand, it's all around the user experience. So there are expectations that the products will do more and more. So somehow an expectations of features, but on the other hand, we have to balance it. Um, many people find the cut tools easier than they used to be, but actually only 50% of the user um, base feel that they know how to make the most out of these tools. Um, which basically leaves 50% of the user base somewhat frustrated um, as they are not able to maximize what they do um, with these um, tools. Um, so user experience, expectations, and innovation in the product is still something um, that will need to play a big part um, in a, any cut tool uh, translation software provider, but it's certainly one area where we're going to be focusing on. Just if I can add to what of Matt course. said, I think what was quite interesting you said it uh, alluded to it, Massey, was you know trying to make things easy for people to use. We as SDL have had SDL Trados for 25, 30 years now, so our remit has always been to try and add productivity features for the wealth of people that are using the product. Um, and that it is a very comprehensive solution. There's a lot in there, but we clearly see that user experience side of things, the technology is only as good as how you can use it and address it. So we have to make sure as a remit, and clearly from the research we see this, that the usefulness of technology has to be considered in the user experience. Accessible. And, and as you said, Matthew, it's kind of that balance we're always looking at is making sure that we we look at people who are using the tool for the first time and also those who are experienced users who need to use all the complexity and comprehensiveness of the tool itself. So in summary, just and that we've got a lot of data here, there is a lot more that you can read as well. There are some key highlights uh, from the research. Just a few here that I, we just want to touch on is first there's a strong contrast, Matty alluded to this in the quality slides that there's a big contrast between the importance of quality and actually the mediocre evidence that we saw of standardized measurements. So that's something I think the industry uh, needs to address and we're here as a technology vendor to do, help that. The value of machine translation that despite being far from usually welcome, uh, universally welcomed and used, there is a value there and people are beginning to see that now as the technology um, is beginning to get much better and the quality of MT uh, with NMT, for example, starts to really um, improve. The reality of remote working, chunking, faster turnaround times, that's clearly there and visible for us to see. Matthew again mentioned this, the modi modest use of collaboration tools. So um, there needs to be a conversation about how we can help companies more talk and share the assets that they need to get the productivity side and the quality done. There is a user preference for customization and extending the software, and there is a clear reliance on different types of translation productivity technology. This is when we talked about the integration and seamless workflow side. So a few factors for consideration, quality standards. It may well be time to adopt um, an objective approach 
to consistently deliver against so that everybody in the industry, client, um, LSP, freelancer, all understand from the beginning what is expected in terms of quality and the tools that can help them do that. Embracing MT, actively use and develop it. I think that's a key message to a lot of people is get over the fear um, and the expectation is try it and see what it can do for you. Collaboration tools, existing ways of managing translation products may no longer be sufficient to cope with this new way of working. Open platforms, I think that's a big key thing. And we have had, for example, our app store for what, five, seven years now? Seven or eight years, yes, a long time. Um, 250 applications on top of Studio itself to help people extend their solutions. And so, hundreds more developed internally by enterprises yeah. that have use the API and our App Store approach to create their own internal applications that are not publicly shared. And finally, the customizable technology. So choice and convenience are in higher than agenda for translation technology use. They want to adapt and they want to make sure it fits with their existing systems. So, Matthew? So, I, I guess just one point for for finishing off is that we've done all of this research and we think it's really important that we continue to monitor the market. There are too many added dots um, in, in the industry. And this is a fairly niche industry, therefore not very heavily um, analyzed um, by industry specialists. Um, and so it was really important for us to have some hard data point. And we are the world's largest provider of translation technology. So we have a large user base, a large number of names in our database. So I think we could have access to, we felt that we had uh, uh, the, the ability to create a relevant um, set of information. But obviously, we do want to use all this information. And I know many of you might be our clients and might be using our um, enterprise technology and some of our um, translation productivity specific uh, products like Studio. And I just wanted to sh sort of reflect upon what we've been doing and really try to use some of this information to focus our development. So when we look at Studio 2017 that was launched in November of 2016, um, we focus some areas on quality and productivity with features like fragment matching and fuzzy repairs to make sure that you could maximize that translation memory asset that was built. We did focus also on trying to make machine translation as usable as possible, and we launched AdaptiveMT, which is machine translation that um, improves as it gets used, is private and um, it sort of self-customizes so that the whole experience of using machine translation is improved. Um, and of course, on user experience is in an area where perhaps historically we haven't put as much focus as we wanted to, but we really now are stepping up our effort. Um, and so we look at some long-standing areas of studio like merging of segments and filter displays, but also um, drag and drop and try to make um, starting a translation as quickly um, as possible a reality. And of course, API, um, that is one area as we continue to evolve Studio, we keep on opening up um, new parts of the software so that it can be integrated with other systems um, and further automation can become available. And we are now in the process of our pre-launch for Studio 2019, which will launch very soon. Um, and again, we have been trying to follow our five key pillars. Um, the, the key focus on this release is around user experience. We heard that loud and clear that's one of the areas where we needed to do uh, more. Um, and so we have focused on Walk Me and trying to make the beginner's experience um, um, as good as possible. We want to make sure that users can start translating in minutes rather than hours. Um, we wanted to make sure that existing users make the most of the product and access the very rich functionality of Studio in the shortest possible time. And we have a feature um, called Tell Me that helps people accessing some of the features four times faster than in previous versions. So, it is about user experience, but user experience that drives productivity um, that makes people work faster. Um, of course, um, tell me impacts the general productivity. 
We focused on project management. This is another big area um, that can support those new ways of working, chunking, small project, faster turnarounds. And in Studio 2019, you'll be able to work much quicker. Um, our first um, analysis indicates that you can create new projects 28% quicker. And because we see more and more people getting updates mid projects, we wanted to improve that experience and making sure that projects could be updated as quickly as possible. And our beta um, is showing us that it's possible in Studio 2019 to update a project 82% faster um, in 82% less time than in Studio 2017. So some significant improvements there in working with a lot of small projects. And of course, when it comes to quality, we've been focusing on the QA checks. Um, we had some significant number of QA checks and we wanted to um, improve these. Um, and so there are, there are improvements in the area. And of course, all those assets, those translation memories that have been built um, we want to make sure that they are always in, in, in the best possible uh, shape and they're easily maintained. And so that's work that has gone into Studio 2019 to make sure that maintaining those assets um, is as easy as possible. So we kind of have tried to use, um, we have been using all this output from all this research to drive our product development. Um, so we're trying to listen and act upon what we're hearing. Thank you, Massey. So just to round off from my perspective, I mentioned that at the beginning of the presentation that there is a lot of data. Um, it's clearly not possible to present that all in the time today. So if you're interested and want further reference material, we have six individual eBooks um, that go much further than the presentation we've got today. And they are split into the individual insights, so quality, new ways of working, et cetera. Uh, there is an overall executive summary that you can download as well. Um, the link is on the slide here. I really do recommend that you do that because not only will you get further stats, you'll also get some clearer recommendations on how to solve some of the issues that come up within the research. So um, please do that if you have some time. I think from myself and Massey, that's it. I Now handing back to Leonard, I think he has one final uh, comment to make. So Leonard, over to you. Thank you, um, Massimo and Neil, for presenting on this topic. Uh, yes, um, in, SEO, in the SEO community, we also have one, uh, one group where uh, you can find anything you need uh, from account assistance to all the communication. We uh, do uh, links to training and support, and also um, the recording we will send out. Um, so please take a look in the SEO community and uh, jump to the SEO access group to find out what's in there. Then to close the webinar, uh, thank you again, Massimo and Neil, for presenting today. And all our, uh, to all our attendees, thank you for joining. We hope you found it useful and informative. As uh, mentioned earlier, we'll be sending out a survey, and we would appreciate your feedback to help us improve uh, the webinar series. Also, we'd love to welcome you to one of our next SEO Access events. We will send the link to the recording and also publish it into the SEO Access community and onto YouTube. So have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.